This is a little little different. The um, uh, kind of lecture that um, that Steve agreed to, and I think it'll be really be a lot of fun. He and, and his <laughs> in his group um, sang at our and uh, the, the, the groups um, sang at our um, garden party this summer, and that was a huge hit. And that's what made me start to think about the fact that it would be fun to do have one of the lectures be a little more um, a little more lively. And so Steve <laughs> um, and Steve certainly needs no introduction, but he is a genuine, authentic Marblehead fisherman. And <laughs> Right. Here he is in person. Um, and Steve's going to introduce the rest of the musicians, and we're really so happy to have all of you here this evening. So thank you very much for coming. Okay, uh, this is Peter Hardy Souza, and uh, Peter is our fearless leader of a group called Three Sheets to the Wind, and he also sings with his wife Hardy, and uh, Tony Hilliard, his wife Janet Young. And uh, Tony is also part of Three Sheets of the Wind. And Peter and, I mean, Tony and Janet are also known as the Dory Mates. And uh, none of us drink. It's <laughs> <laughs> crazy. Very boring. Very boring. But anyway, we'd like to, uh, like to start off this evening. Tony and I are going to do a song, and then uh, Peter and Audie will do another one, and then Tony and Janet will come and do another one, then I'll go into the. Uh, talking about commercial fishing here. So, uh, we have a song that we, we like to do with, actually called Make and Break Harbor, it's written by Stan Rogers. But because of the Marblehead Maritime Festival, we thought we'd better change it to Marblehead Harbor. And it's actually a song about commercial fishing, about how bad the commercial fishing had gotten up in Nova Scotia and the Maritimes. We're kind of faced with the same kind of situation around here now, where commercial fishing is really a tough way to make a living. So many restrictions and, and uh, there's so few fish. It's a uh, pretty, pretty tough way to make a living. So anyway, Tony and I are going to do Marblehead Harbor. <laughs> How still lies the bay in the light western air With the glows from the crimson horizon Once more we tack home with the dry empty hold, saving gas with the breezes so fair. She's a kindly cape islander, old, but still sound, but so lost in the long liner shadow. Make it break and make do, but the fish are so few that she won't be replaced. Could she found her in Marblehead Harbor? The boats are so few, too many are pulled up and rotten. Most houses stand empty, old nets hung to dry, are blown away, lost and forgotten. It's so hard to not think of before the big war When the card went so cheap but so plenty Foreign trawlers go by now with long stinging eyes Baiting all where we sell them any And the young folks don't stay with the fishermen's ways Long ago, they all moved to the cities. And the ones left behind are all tired and blind. Won't work for a pound for a penny. In Marblehead Harbor, the boats are so few. Too many are full up and rotten. Houses stand empty, old nets hung to dry, are blown away, lost and forgotten. Now I 
can see the big dragon has stirred up the bay. Bleeding lobster traps smashed on the bottom. And the naked don't pay to respect the old ways that my old head men have not forgotten. For we still need our time to the turn of the tide. In this boat that I built with my powder, still lifts to the sky, the one wonder and I still talk like old friends on the water. In Marblehead Harbor, the boats are so few, too many are pulled up and rotten. Houses stand empty, old nets hung to dry, are blown away, lost and forgotten. In Marblehead Harbor, the boats are so few, too many are pulled up and rotten. Most houses stand empty, old nets hung to dry. Are blown away, lost and forgotten.
society. This kind of reminds me of Stephen White as one of the lyrics is that crazy old fool goes down on the bay. That's me. He's not crazy or old. Maybe the younger generation might, might think so. But I'll never forget the time he asked me to come out and watch him change the water in his traps. <laughs> that accused me of being a Jonah. He probably wasn't too far from the But uh, growing up in Rockport, I had a lot of, a lot of fun hanging around the wharf watching the older fishermen, lobstermen come and go. And I always, always think of the songs of Mike Woodenbach out of uh, Camp in Maine. When the wind's away and the wave away, that crazy old fool will go down on the bay, dodging the ledges and setting his gear, and come back when the wind drives him in. And he knows full well the fishing is done. His credit's all gone and the winter has come. But as sure as the tide will rise and run, you'll go back on the bay again. When the snow is down on the western bay, that fool go running the filler's ground, hauling his gear in the trough of the sea, as if he'd no mind of his own. And he knows full well the fishing is done, his credit's all gone and the winter has come. But as sure as Tides will rise and run, you'll go back on the bay again. Well, his father's gone and his brothers are gone, yet still he goes down on the dark of the moon, rowing the dory and setting the twine, and it won't even pay for his time. And he knows full well the fishing is done. His credit's all gone and the winter has come. But as sure as the tides will rise and run, you'll go back on the bay. Children go down on the morning sun. They go rowing in little boats out on the tide, and they'll follow their foolish old man. But your blind old fool, your children are gone, and you never would tell them the fishing was done. Their days were numbered. The day they were born, the same as their foolish old man. The days were numbered, the day they were born, the same as their foolish old man. stories, a few sad stories. Uh, I think maybe what we'll do is take a little break during the middle of things and let you come up and look at some of these books and pictures and things that are here. Help you to uh, understand a little bit about it. But anyway, I started commercial fishing when I was 12 years old. And you can see this big fish that this other fellow and I are holding up here. That was about a 50-pound codfish. 
and uh, I grew up on 80 Front Street right across from the Marblehead Trading Company. It used to be Graves' upper yard. And needless to say, it was just natural for me to wander across the street and get involved in boats and sailing and fishing. Uh, I was running launches and teaching sailing probably at 11, 12 years of age. And uh, Odie Melmore, who owned the Marblehead Rental Boat Company, and uh, my wife's uncle, Donald Russell, bought a Novi boat out of Saugus. Now, a Novi boat is just a term for a boat built in Nova Scotia. So they called them Novi boats. This boat in particular happened to be called the Novi. That was her name. She was a 40-footer. And uh, about a week after they bought it and brought it to Marblehead, we had a hurricane. So we took the boat over to Salem to tie it up in a secure anchorage. And uh, out of the 400 traps that they bought with the boat, I think they lost over 300. So that was a, not a good way to start a business. But, uh, we started hooking, which is fishing tub trawls. This is not an accurate tub because we use wooden tubs, but this is accurate as far as the size. But you can see the line is coiled into the tub. And what we would do, we'd dump this tub out onto the bench and we'd coil it back in and bait each hook as we went and stack the baits up against one side of the tub. And uh, we'd go off and, and set this gear for cod fish and paddock. And I was the, uh, as I said, 12 years old, and they used to let me run the boat while they set these tubs of trawl. And this is, this is what they call a line, one line. There's about 100 hooks in that line. There's three lines for the tub, so you got about 300 hooks in each tub. And as the boat moved forward, you throw the anchor over, and then as the uh, boat sea line, you take a stick and you whip the bait made the hooks out of the tub like this as the boat moved ahead. And I was the one running the boat, 12 years old, and Odie was in the, he was there setting the, the hooks. And something would happen, yeah, you throw the stick down, you just use the back of your wrist like this to flip the hooks out. Well, the nice thing I know, he's got the hook in the back of his wrist, and he's headed for the back of the boat like this. And I put that thing in reverse, and I poured the coals to it, and I stopped it just before he went over the stern. He had the living bejesus out of it. So, when, when they were set out from Ella, I'd go hide down. The cabin scared me so badly. But uh, in my freshman, freshman year of high school, during our winter break over New Year's and Christmas, we had two weeks off, I chartered that very same boat. I had another kid to go with me, and we went hooking for two weeks. And uh, we didn't make a lot of money, but we didn't lose money. We caught fish, and we, we did okay for a couple of high school kids, you know. So that was quite an experience. So we were set. I think the last day we had 11 tubs baited up. And back to school the next day, we didn't get out. It was windy. We had 11 tubs of gear baited up aboard the boat. We had to go set it just to get the bait off of it. So we went out, set the 11 tubs, hauled it back, and slatted all the bait off, and coiled it back into the tubs, and put it all away. Went back to school. <laughs> it was kind of fun. So. From there, uh, we went lobstering in the summers and, and hooking, what they call hooking, setting tub trawls. Uh, you could call it trawling, but trawling is actually the process of dragging a net behind a boat. So this was called hooking. Uh, lobster gear, you know, when I was very young, I used to go around and collect the old plaster lads. If somebody was remodeling a house, I'd pick up the lads off the side of the road and I'd take them home and I build a frame and I put these lads on there and create a lobster trap. And uh, I had a fellow who lived in Jackie Burns' shanty down at Fort Sewell. And he was kind of a homeless guy and he would knit heads with the nets for the traps. So I'd get my heads from him and I'd build these traps out of softwood and, and plaster lads and they caught lobsters. Uh, this is more typical of the traps that we used to build when they were all wood. Uh, unlike this one, which is, as you say, a wooden frame with all netting on the sides. And oftentimes they would put wire, which is what this trap is built of, is the uh, wire. They started using this for the doors and the bottoms. And then they evolved to all wire like this one. So the 
whole thing about lobstering is you're trying to trick these lobsters. You're trying to fool them. So they enter, you hang a bait bag right, right in the middle here, with bait on it. And they climb in through these openings here, which is called the kitchen. This is called the kitchen. And uh, they get in there, they eat the bait, and then they look for the easiest way out. Well, the easiest way out was to go out through this net that goes into the back of the trap because it was like a ramp. They'd crawl right up over the ramp instead of having to climb out through these rings here. The idea was to trap them in the back of the trap so they couldn't get out. It would take them longer to figure it out. It'd give you enough time to get out and haul the trap and catch these things before they get away, which they could do. They figured it out after a while. Uh, some of the things that have changed, of course, they say we went to the wire traps. And uh, one of the best things they ever did in these traps, they require us now to put an escape vent, which is what this is. And that allows all the small short lobsters to go through this vent and escape rather than being in the trap and getting bitten and losing claws and being damaged by the fishermen ripping them out of the traps trying to get to the keepers. There was just a lot of damage happening. It wasn't necessary. So that was uh, probably the best thing they ever came up with, was that escape vent. Mm. Uh, I used to work for a lobsterman named Joe Walker. And Joe was an American Indian lobsterman here in town. And uh, he had one of the shanties down at Fort Sewell. There's two groups of shanties, which are fishermen's workshops here in Marblehead. One is down at Fort Sewell. There's about eight of them, I think. And they're on town land. The guys pay rent to the town once a year. And uh, they have the right to use these shanties and store their gear. So I would go down after school and work for Joe building traps, very much like this one that you're looking at here. It's not 100% accurate. This was built by Winchester Fishing Gear up in Gloucester, just as kind of a display piece. Uh, typically, these. You see the ropes that are holding the nets in here. We'd actually use copper nails to hold the side, and we'd use an oak stick to hold the top and bottom. Uh, we would uh, we could buy the kits. You can you would buy kits, and then we'd assemble them in the shop. Uh, also, you know, we spent the winter painting buoys. This was this was Joe's color. Joe was orange and, and uh, yellow. And uh, he was very fussy. All the buoys had to be sanded and painted just so. Uh, took a lot of pride in this. He had a boat called the Whistler. And he was a very superstitious man. And, and it's believed that if you whistle aboard a boat, you're going to whistle up a storm. So it's considered bad luck to whistle aboard a boat. Yeah. And Joe was very superstitious. The other thing was that uh, you never never ever turn a hatch upside down aboard a boat. That's the worst kind of bad luck. And when I had my boat, I had my crew. Every time I hired a new crew member, the rest of the guys were just waiting for the new guy to turn a hatch over because I knew what was going to happen. I was going to jump right down his throat and say, don't ever do that again. So uh, Joe's boat was what they call a Jonesport style. Boat built in Jonesport, Maine. Very long and lean, narrow, 32 foot, probably 8 feet wide. But they, they you know, slid through the water very nicely, they're fuel efficient. Uh, that boat was lost, I don't know what year it was, but my Head Harbor froze over solid one winter. And Joe's boat was on the mooring out by the transportation company. The wind came from the east and broke up all the ice and took it down harbor and took the boat with it. Destroyed it. So we had to uh, borrow some money and call the boat builder up in uh, Jonesport, say, go me another boat, quick. So we went up to pick the boat up. And uh, two of the fellows brought the boat back, and, and the other two of us drove back in the car. But uh, it was a boat almost identical to the one he lost. Uh, the uh, Novi boat that I spoke about earlier, uh, there again, that was a term used to describe Nova Scotian boats, and they were. They were good-looking boats. They had nice lines. They were all built out of wood, suitable for fiberglass. And uh, the uh, boats now out of Nova Scotia, they're building fiberglass boats. Some of them are a little crude. 
In fact, one of the builders up there got the nickname Chainsaw. <laughs> so crude, it's like somebody crafted it out with a chainsaw. That's what his nickname became. They were known as Chainsaw Boats. Uh, they're just not the same as a good wooden boat. Now, the uh, lobster buoys, there again, used to be wood like this. They've been outlawed because they damage propellers and things. So we've gone now to what they call a, uh, a foam buoy. It's a plastic foam, much lighter. And, and if you hit it with a propeller, cut the buoy rather than bend the pro propeller. Uh, I once kidded over the radio one day. I said, I know what I'm going to do this winter. I'm going to open a buoy factory because that's where the money is. And somebody heard that and took it and ran with it. The next thing you know, the word is around town, I'm going to be running a buoy factory. <laughs> so, uh, uh, this is a trap here. This is a replica that a friend Joey Sylvester makes. And this is a coffee table. Put a piece of glass on top. It's all mahogany. And he knits all the heads, all the netting himself. He sells these for coffee tables. He's down, and he's got one of the shanties down at uh, the beach in, in Little Harbor. Now those shanties down there, down by the, the lower yard or by the Marblehead Lobster Company, there's, uh, there again, about eight of them. And they're on association land. In other words, the, the land is owned by the group of people who own the shanties, and they pay rent. And that's unlike the one that's over Fort Sewell, which is town owned. My wife and I have a shanty in our backyard, which was her father's workshop when he was lobstering. And he used to build his traps out there. Um, her father was Henry Briggs, and Henry Briggs and, and uh, Freddie Bartlett and a couple of other people formed the uh, Massachusetts Lobstermen's Association, the co-op. In our kitchen. <laughs> and that was located over Saugus. That was a fisherman's co-op where they would buy your trip and you could buy your supplies through the co-op at a better price, like a farm co-op, you know, same kind of thing. Unfortunately, it's gone out of business. But, uh, okay. Uh, lobstering, of course, you need bait to catch these lobsters. Bait has always been a problem. Some of us managed to catch our own gill nets or whatever. I, I used to catch most of my own bait. But then, one, one year, the two boats that used to run out of Gloucester, there was a place called the Dehyde, which is a dehydration plant in Gloucester. Had two boats that fished for men Hayden. And these men Hayden were rendered for their oil. And the oil is used in, uh, like Rustolian paint, uses men Hayden oil. But the solids, the dried solids, were used as chicken food. And the, the big chicken outfits actually own these dehydration plants, especially down in Reedville, Virginia. There's a huge one called Omega Protein. I think they've got 14 boats in the 200-foot range. That their sole purpose is to sane for Manhattan. In fact, they've just built two new state-of-the-art 250-footers. So, I don't know that I totally agree with the number of fish that this outfit is taking for chicken food. Um, but that's, that's what it is, basically. Uh, so I started fishing with a friend of mine, moving on now in, into the 80s. Uh, we were fishing gill nets for Manhattan over Salem Harbor. And we were doing pretty well. We were catching 40, 50 boxes a day. But it was very labor intensive, very tiring. So another fellow, a couple of other fellows and myself, with our two boats, started seining for Ben Hayden. And that's less labor intensive because you set a big net in a circle around a school of fish and you pull the drawstring on the bottom and you trap the fish. That's called perch seining. And uh, so we started doing that. And we had a few fish in the net over in Salem one day, and it was a little windy. So one of the fellows said, uh, well, I guess I'd better throw the anchor over. He got up on the stern of the boat with a 100-pound anchor and he swung back like that. He heaved it. And when he heaved it, it caught it right in the front of the apron, just like that. And over he went. Splash. 
Now, his friend on the boat with him was a big heavy set guy. He just fell on the deck and was literally rolling on the deck laughing so hard he couldn't even help this guy who was down the bottom with the anchor. <laughs> and I was on my boat watching this whole thing happen. So, finally, Billy comes up, spitting out water, he's clawing at the side of the boat like this. And the other fellow is still laying on the deck, just rolling on the deck, just laughing, laughing. Like <laughs> So Billy finally managed to climb back aboard the boat all by himself without any help. He looked over at me, and in his gravelly voice, he says, Well, while I was down there, he says, I stuck it in the mud real good. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, it was the funniest thing I ever saw, I have to admit. I said, look, if you could just reenact that and let me get it on film, <laughs> guaranteed winners of the $200,000 grand prize of the funniest home video, I'll split it with you, right down the middle. Well, what if I don't live through it? I said, well, so what's the problem? I'll split it with your wife. <laughs> but all the fishermen used to use on the marine radio, Channel 19, that was our channel to talk back and forth. Well, Billy became known as the Channel 19 Anchor Man. <laughs> <laughs> he says to me, he says, you're never going to let me bring that up here. I say, hell no, that's the funniest thing I ever saw. <laughs> well, that, that was one funny story. Like I said, there's a lot of funny stories, a lot of sad stories. But uh, that was one of the funnier ones, I have to say. Uh, so, from there, my friend Larry Smith and I decided to get into seining in a bigger way. So we set up his boat, which was a 31-foot JC lobster boat, to be the seining boat that would carry the net and set it around the school of fish. And I bought a boat, or actually we bought the boat in partnership, which was a 43-foot dragger, to carry the fish to sell to the lobstermen for bait. Well, I knew that the uh, airplane pilot who worked for the two big boats up in Gloucester uh, when the dehyde plant closed, he was out of work. But he had bought this boat because he took his commission in fish and he was going to run a little bait business and take the commission in fish rather than cash and run a bait business. Well, he wasn't very successful. So he'd send the boat down to Rhode Island for a prospective buyer and then that fell through. So I went to him and I said, look, I said, I know you've got this boat and you're stuck with it. So I said, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I said, I'll take the boat off your hands. This is what I'll give you for it. And I said, all I want for you, from you in return, and I have to realize he had just bought the, uh, the uh, flight training center over Beverly Airport. It was a new business he was just starting out, so he needed a little extra income. And he was no longer squatting fish because the boats were tied up. So I said, I'll buy this boat from you, and I'll run a bait business. And I said, I want you to be my squatter pilot. But I want you to sign an agreement. If I buy this boat, take it off your hands, that you'll fly for me and nobody else for the rest of your natural life. <laughs> <laughs> he said, okay. <laughs> we actually had a lawyer draft the contract, and he signed it. He'd fly for us unless we gave him permission, which we would do occasionally to let him set some of our competition. There were two or three small operations in the area, one out of Boston, one out of Revere. And, uh, we would all work together most of the time, not all the time. But if I had extra fish, I'd give them to one of these fellows. And if he needed the plane to set, set him, I'd let the plane do that. Or if he had extra fish, he'd give them to me. So we all kind of worked together most of the time. Uh, one day, I had been to talk to a fellow in Swampsville about perhaps buying another boat to make my operation a little bigger. And he said, well, if I don't sell the boat, I I might go carry a little bit of bait for the guys in Swaps. He said, does that bother you? And I said, no, but I don't sell to the guys in Swaps, so that's fine with me. Well, he showed up one day over off the Revere, and I had the plane up there, and we'd agreed to let the plane set him. And he showed up to buy bait from this from competition in, in uh, Gloucester, which we had agreed to let the plane set the guy. So I called him on the radio, and I said, uh, where are you going to sell this bait if I let you uh, use our plane? Anywhere I want to. He said, well, my partner called Arnie. He's the title of the plane. He's Arnie. Don't set him. And the fellow called me back. He said, 
what's the matter with him? I said, well, I guess he didn't like your answer. <laughs> Why should we, you know, fill up your boat to go sell to our customers? You know, it doesn't work that way. So that was the end of that story. Um, <laughs> we did pretty well for two or three years, and we averaged about 30,000 pounds of fish a day. We sold bait to all the fishermen in Gloucester, uh, not Gloucester, Salem, Beverly, Marblehead, basically, a few from Manchester. But we would take orders in the morning. I'd get on the radio, I'd call the fleet, I said, how many boxes of bait do you want today? And each guy would call me back, I said, I want 10, I want 2, I want 1. Total it all up, call the plane, we need 100 boxes of fish today, aren't we? Okay, he said, I'll go find 100 boxes of fish. And this guy, <laughs> he's from the plane, could tell what kind of fish he was looking at wow. Wow. and roughly how many were in that school. And sometimes he'd be right on the money, sometimes we'd come up short, and if we came up short, we had to do it again. And sometimes we'd get enough to fill the boat in one set. Uh, but we'd just keep doing it until we got enough to cover our orders, and then we'd go send the plane back to the airport. We'd go hang on a mooring over Salem Harbor and call the fleet, and they'd come over and buy their bait. And, uh, the ones that didn't get the bait during the day would come to my house in the evening because I had a big 10 by 18 walk-in freezer, John and Nancy did, <laughs> in my backyard. And uh, any fish that was left over went into the freezer and then could be sold out of the freezer. So that meant that we didn't have to waste fish. You know, if we had extra, we could put in the freezer. And that was a good, good break. Uh, the fellow wrote a book called White Tipped Orange Mass. It's about all the draggers in uh, New Bedford and Gloucester. Most of these boats, if you remember, being Gloucester, had orange masts with white tips on them. And uh, my boat included. Was one of it didn't make the book because my boat actually came from down at Cape May, New Jersey. But it's one of the last, the last ones. I've still got a piece of the mast in my backyard. Um, there's one boat in here that I fished on called the Challenge when I fished on it. That was a gill netter. But a fellow from the Washer bought it, turned it into a dragger. And uh, it's kind of hard to see. I know this is it here. She was a 50 foot decked over. What, what that means is she was decked over high. Her decks were up just below the rail. And I call it the gray submarine because that damn thing wouldn't lift its bow to go over a wave. Just right through. green water would go right up over the top of the house. Just it was a horrible boat. <laughs> but, uh, another story about that boat: the fellow that owned it, they were going out one day out of Marblehead, heading up to the hall of the nets, and they saw a big boat come out of Boston, and they kind of watched it. They didn't think much of it. Oh, he'll turn. He'll turn. Well, we'll hold our course, he'll turn, and this thing, BAM! T-bone! And, and it just made a, a big V, about, started about this big, and went down like this, right to the water line. And fortunately, it was a calm day, and they moved all the weight to one side, got the boat to lay over, and they got into Marblehead safely, but very nearly lost her that day. <laughs> but my friend, George Dunn, that was a skipper, says, he says, them damned Italians, he says, they sprung up like dandelions, they were everywhere. He says, one of them ran up on the bow of the boat, looked over the bow, and just pointed back to Boston. <laughs> uh, while we're talking about purse sailing, I'd like Peter to do a song called, uh, Won't You Help Me to Raise Them, Boys? And what this song is about, it's about, basically it was written about or by some of the African-American Menhaden fishermen down off the coast of Virginia and the Carolinas. And uh, when you set these purse seines around a school of fish, these big omega protein boats, they set a seine that's 600 fathom long. That'll hold a million pounds of fish. So that's a lot of weight. But in order to get these fish bailed out or pumped out of the net, you had to pull the extra net up from underneath the fish to hold them up to the surface so you could stick your dip net or your pump in there to pump them up. So you had people lined up around along the rail of the same boat pulling the net up, pulling yeah. the net up until they dried these fish up so they could bail. So this song, won't you help me to raise them boys, that's what it's talking about, raising the net up to pull the fish up so you bail them. So if you would. <laughs> <laughs> 
And actually, uh, I was lucky enough to have the pleasure of singing with these guys one night down at Mystic Seaport, and they're all black gentlemen, and they're all in their mid 80s now, and they're, they're just great. But I asked them to stay all past 8:30, and they didn't want to do it. So, no, no, Peter, we can't do that anymore. <laughs> That's right. It was fun. So it's a great chorus. So join in with us. Oh, won't you help me to raise them, boys? Oh, honey. Oh, won't you help me to raise them, boys? Oh, honey. Oh, won't you help me to raise them, boys? See her when the sun. So, what we 
had to do, we had to reel these nets onto a reel. And down at State Street Wharf, where, which is where the old Boston Yacht Club was, when they tore down the club, we had that wharf there. And we set up these wooden drying racks on this page here. You can't really probably see it, but they were just very simple wooden reels that uh, we turn the reels and two men would feed the net onto the reel. And then, see, originally the nets were cotton, and that was very susceptible to rot. They didn't stand up to weather very well. But then they went to linen, and then finally to nylon or monofilament. And uh, like I said, the original floats were cork, then they went to wood, then aluminum, and finally to plastic floats. And rather than lead weights, they used a, a braided line with lead cork. So now you no longer had the problem of the leads dipping down through. And these new nets could just simply be flaked on the deck of the boat in a pile and set over the stern without any worries about hang-ups. But when we had the old-fashioned nets and had to put them on the reels, we had boxes that were about this, this long. They had flared sides. And we would take the net off the reel and very carefully pack rows of leads on one side and rows of floats on the other. And then all the twine would be in the middle. And when we got through, we'd fold the twine up over the top and tie it to take out and set the next day. So you set, you tie these blocks of the nets together. And as they were setting out over the stern, you pull the box out and slide the next one up. Kind of like setting the tub trough. It's the same idea. You know, you set one tub, take the tub away, put the next one up, just keep going. But uh, those, those reels, uh, I think they paid us a buck a piece to, to do these nets. Each net was about 300 feet long. Uh, that was what they call a half net. A full net was actually 600 feet, but a full net was a bit cumbersome, so they made them into half nets. Uh, so the challenge, or the Belinda, the one that I showed you, was in the what white tip orange mass is the boat that we used to use uh, the gillnet, one of the boats. She was 50 foot, and uh, we kept her over at uh, Pickering Wharf, which was actually Pickering Wharf didn't exist. It was there as an oil terminal, but it wasn't a marina at the time. But at Congress Street, there was one town dock there, and we used to tie up there in the wintertime. And uh, went over one morning with George Dunn to, to go out fishing. And it was cold. I don't know, it was zero. And the river was frozen over, and that boat just wouldn't start. She just didn't want She had a gasoline donkey engine to actually turn the starter or start the but it just wouldn't start. So he said, okay, the heck with that. And George took me back to his house in Salem. And I just wore khaki pants, you know. I was a that was tough. You know, I didn't need insulated <laughs> pants when I ate that, you know. So George's wife took pity on me, and uh, the next time I went over to the house, she had gone up in the attic and found George's little army pants, <laughs> woolen army pants. And she said, you didn't try these on. Well, they, they were like knickers on. <laughs> Very short. But, uh, I don't know where I was going with that one, but anyway. <laughs> Uh, that, that was the, the challenge, and, and we went out as pretty horrendous weather, and, and you know, everything would be iced up, the fish would freeze as soon as they broke the surface of the water, before they got to the rail of boat, they'd be frozen, you know, covered with frost. But that was fun. And um, the thing is that when I was doing this, every time I went out, and I went out every weekend after school, every time I got a chance, I get seasick every time. Oh, yeah. And I'd get up the next morning, I'd go out, and I'd do it all over again. And this was just for fun. I wouldn't get paid for this. Uh, but I figured that saved my life. Because if it weren't for that, I love fishing. I would have been on the offshore boats. I would have been sword fishing, probably working for Robert Brown. I might be, I'd be dead now, probably. You know? <laughs> one, of the, one of the people that didn't make it. Uh, so I, I kind of thank the seasickness for saving my life. Uh, you might have seen the, the movie The Perfect Storm, and one of the fellows came down and he said he had a bad feeling. He thought he was going to stay ashore this trip, and that was the 
kind that you want. Uh, I worked with a fellow here in town, his name was Bill Whipple. He was a divinity student going to Northeastern College to be a minister. But he thought he'd uh, put himself through school by fishing. So he bought a nice little 32-foot Jonesport boat, like we were talking about earlier, long and lean, 32-footer. Boat used to belong to a fellow named Watson Curtis, who was one of the local fishermen here. At least so bad that his nickname was Shredded Wheat. <laughs> well, Fred Dodge, a local contractor, bought the boat and totally did it over. And the thing was like a yacht. It had brownish trim. And it was all painted up pretty. And, and Whipple bought this thing, and he was gill netting, hauling the nets by hand rather than with a hauler. Uh, he was a big, rugged man. And he was doing quite well with it. He was making money. Uh, but he was fishing nights and weekends after school. He came down one evening, it was 6 o'clock in the evening, and he had the boat into the wharf with the transportation company. It was 6 o'clock in the evening, it was 10 degrees, blowing a gale from the southwest, and it was snowing. And all the guys at the transportation company said, don't go out. Don't go out. Well, he was rather stubborn, so he decided he was going to go. But I was standing there with one foot on the rail of the boat, one foot on the float. I had my boots, I had my oil skins. And I said, took my foot off the boat like that, I'm not going. And he got out there and uh, there was some condensation in the fuel line. It froze and the engine stalled. So he called, or signaled with a flashlight, I guess, and got the attention of a little coastal tanker called the Lucy Rhino. He used to go up the Danish River. And she came alongside, and of course, the steel tanker and a little wooden lobster boat came together like that and broke every frame in the wooden boat right at the turn of the bilge. And she opened up, she decided to take on water. Mm -hmm. And Bill tried to bail up a five gallon bucket, and the result of that, he spent two weeks in the hospital with his frozen hands. Mm -hmm. The boat was towed by the Coast Guard until it turned over, and they abandoned it. And, uh, Somebody down to Citra, I think, found it drifting around and claimed salvage on it. Basically, it was a good little boat. It needed some repairs at that point, but uh, somebody got wound up with a good boat. Whipple then bought the Novi, the 40-foot Novi that I had fished on. And he uh, fished her. And he set, uh, set some lobster gear. We went out one day and we set some lobster gear. And uh, he looked at the chart. And he reasoned out, well, this looks like a good piece of bottom. Let's set some gear on this piece of bottom here. And in those days, we were fishing all single traps. There were none of these trawls. Today, they're fishing trawls, 15, 20 traps with the buoy on each end, all single. So we ran out a string of traps, and we were laying to, and uh, one of the other local lobstermen, call him local, he thought he was local, he was from Revere, actually a transplant, came here from Revere. <laughs> Bill Whipple grew up here in town. He was a local boy. And uh, this fellow started swearing at us and yelling at us, and we followed him around, and we set gear all of his, and then, hey, we didn't follow him around. We looked at the chat, we picked this piece of bottom, we sat out here, we never even saw it. Wow. Well, the next day we went out, there was nothing but boobies float around the hooks. So it was pretty obvious who had done this. Well, we were in Velo Powers' lobster pool down where the landing restaurant is now in the back room where they weighed the lobsters. And uh, this fellow came in, Buddy Pearson. And this fellow, George Berry, was one of the local fellows. George was a man you didn't mess with. He was a master. They said he could pick an engine out of a car like that. And I can't believe it. He didn't mess with George. Well, George went over and he grabbed Bud by the front of the shirt and kind of took a couple turns. I could pick his feet right off the floor like that and put him up against the wall. Now, he says, if you ever, ever touch another man's gear around here again, you're dead. That's the way things were settled. <laughs> and uh, like I say, he just didn't mess with this film. Uh, Below Powers owned the, he built the landing restaurant actually after uh, after he run this lobster pool there. And Salty Sam's restaurant was in the front of the building. It was a little tin shack and there was a little restaurant called Salty Sam's. 
and uh, it was run by, at one point, Porky Palmer. Uh, Porky's son, Buzzy, was our police chief for a while. But uh, Porky was kind of a character. He actually had placemats made up. There used to be a storm drain, it still is, but it came down in a slipway that has since been filled in. Where the wharf is there, right by the restaurant. He actually had placemats made up for the restaurant. Uh, Salty Sam's restaurant where the sewer meets the sea. <laughs> Right now, I've, I've got a couple of historians looking for one of these placemats. I, I know that somewhere out there, there's got to be one of these placemats. <laughs> but anyway, one day the uh, coastal warden boat from Boston, the Lula Maid, came in, tied up with a float. And Bud Frost, who was a local fellow, was the captain. And he had a rookie with him. Well, the rookie came into the restaurant. I just happened to be there. And he said to Porky, he said, what do you have today that's good? Porky said, well, he says, you know, he said, I've got a nice piece of sweat which just came off the boat. Oh, Georgie Berry on the challenge, he was skipping the challenge at that time, had just brought in a big gray shark and he cut off a bunch of steaks and <laughs> gave the Porky. Oh, this was before eating shark was fashionable. Yeah. So the guy said, well, that sounds good. I'll have some of the sweat official. Oh. Porky broil up a piece of uh, gray shark French fries, lettuce and tomato, tartar sauce, the whole thing. He served it to this guy, and the guy ate it, loved it. Porky says, how was the swordfish? Oh, God, that's the best swordfish I ever had. He said, well, I'm glad, because you just ate a piece of gray shark. Well, the guy went ballistic. He was going to sue Porky. He was going to shut him down. He was going to do this. He was going to do that. And just at that time, Bud Frost, the captain, walked in. Saying, you ain't going to do nothing of the kind. He said, get down to the boat, keep your mouth shut. The guy was just having fun with it. He wasn't even going to charge you for the meal. <laughs> so, at one point, Bill Powers, who owned the building, had his son Bill Powers working there. The restaurant was being run by another fellow, after Porky. His name was Bill Powers. He had a son, Bill Power. So there were four people in that building, Bill Power. <laughs> so. That's weird. Okay. Uh, the, there's another very colorful character that uh, fished out of Marblehead, and he fished what they call a fish trap, floating fish trap, which is a big, about 200 feet long and 100 feet wide was the main body of the trap, and it was one inch heavy mesh netting. Uh, the trap had what they call a heart and a mouth, and then a leader that was anchored and floating out. There was one out by Cat Island, and there was another by Tinkers. George Berry had the trap at Cat Island, and Watson Curtis had the trap at Tinkers. But the fish would swim down along Devereaux Beach, and they'd hit this leader that went to the bar on Tinkers Island, and they'd swallow that leader right into the trap. And we'd go out there in the morning, early, like 4 o'clock in the morning, and we'd haul the trap. And hauling the trap meant picking up the, the mouth of it. And uh, we had two big dories, Banks dories. This is a gunning dory over here, but Banks dory is a big straight-sided dory. And uh, so you'd take one of these dories with two or three guys, and you'd, you'd pull the net up and you'd keep pulling it up and dropping it down underneath itself and moving along and forcing the fish down to the end of the trap into what we call the pocket on the end of the trap, which was a piece of net that was a, it was a section of netting that was about 30 foot square. And when you got the fish all into this pocket, you could then, just like uh, raising them up in the seine, you do the same thing, you'd pull the extra netting up until you got the fish up tight enough so you could bail them into the dories. And each of these dories would carry about 5,000 pounds of fish. And mainly mackerel, we got a lot of mackerel, a lot of butterfish, uh, and just about any other kind of fish you can imagine, cod, pollock, monkfish, we threw the monkfish away. <laughs> I wish I had the monkfish that we'd thrown away at today's prices. They were just trash. The, uh, once we got the fish into the dories, we told them back around the head, put a man in the stern of each one to bail just as fast as you could. And then, uh, these boats were loaded to, to the point where they were just level with the water. 
and uh, one little <laughs> misstep and you're going to sink. So we'd get them into Sea Street Wharf, we'd uh, roll them into the dock and uh, bail the fish onto sorting tables where we sorted the mackerel by size and the butterfish and then shipped them off to Boston by truck. And when we got through doing that, we take the remaining fish, the pollock and the whiting and what have you, and we go lobstering. So Watson was fishing what we call bear traps. They were wooden traps like this. This is a 36 inch trap. We were fishing 48 inch traps. And they were all wood. They weighed 110 pounds. That's why they were referred to as bear traps. They were just terribly heavy. But uh, Watson was kind of a colorful character. And at one point, we got together and we had a meeting at the Harbor Master's office, which was, used to be in the old uh, townhouse down in the basement where they just remodeled the whole thing. Um, had a meeting there at the Harbor Master's office about putting in a conveyor belt down to State Street Landing, which some of you have probably seen down there that we used to bring the traps and the fish up and down from the boat. Well, Watson Curtis was kind of boisterous. He got up. I got to back up a little bit because the boat that he had was a 50-foot main built lobster. It was a real pretty boat. I always wanted to have one built just like it. But it had six berths, accommodations for six people. And it was all mahogany down below. It was beautiful. Well, my friend Steve Goodwin and I started sleeping aboard the boat to go fishing with Watson just for fun. We didn't get paid for it. It was fun. It was fun to sleep on the boat. You know, we'd be there and the Engine was started at 4 o'clock, and we'd go out to Tinkers and haul the trap and come back. Well, anyway, uh, it got to the point where Stevie brought a friend, the friend brought a friend, and the next thing you know, all six births are full, and Watson's got six men working for him, not getting paid, just going for fun. It got to the point where we had to make reservations to go work for Watson and not get paid. <laughs> So we're having this meeting, and uh, us kids had, you know, sorted and packed and lugged thousands and thousands of bushels of fish up that gangway. Well, Watson gets up, and he, oh God, he says, this is the best idea. He said, I, this is the best idea I've ever heard about. He says, I can't tell you how many bushels of fish I've lugged up over that gangway over the years. I think this is a great idea. I said, I can tell you, Watson, you never looked at God here. What? I said, this kid looked all those fish for you. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, another uh, well known fisherman in Marblehead is Hugh Bishop. Hugh has written this book with his sister Brenda called Marblehead's First Harbor, and it's actually available here in the museum. Hughie had a boat called The Mistress which I think is probably about the best name you can find for a boat, because they are a mistress, you know. Uh, it was a 50-footer, built up in Maine back in the 70s. He, uh, he went offshore lobstering for a while, and then uh, he gave that up, and he uh, was cooking. And I, I worked with Hugh a little bit, and uh, we used to go occasionally out to Cashew's Ledge, which is 80 miles out of Marblehead. And uh, there's only about 35 foot of water on top of the ledge. But the, there was pollock out there like you wouldn't believe. We fished hand lines for pollock, jigging for pollock. We had five hooks on the line, big jig, and then four more hooks up the line. And you couldn't get that line halfway to the bottom if you loaded up with pollock this big. So it means you've got five fish this big on, on the line at the same time. And we had a roller mounted on the rail of the boat to pull this line because if you were just trying to do it without a roll, you never would have been able to pull it. And we could fish and pull in fish just as fast as we could until we were just too exhausted to fish anymore. We used to fish three guys and we two guys would fish, one guy would rest and the other, you know, we'd keep alternating back and forth. Uh, of course the prices we were, I think we got six cents a pound for the damn thing yeah. and we got them in here finally. So they were again labor intensive with a long steam. Uh, Huey and I went alone one time, just the two of us took the boat out there. And she did about 10 knots, so you're talking about an eight hour trip. Uh, 
So I had the last watch. And uh, it was getting kind of nasty, so I slowed her down. Huey came up on deck. He said, what are you doing, Steve? And I said, I just slowed her down, Huey. He said, God, I've never slowed this boat down. I said, well, I just did. Hmm. He said, what are we going to do? He says, should we go home? I said, well, home is 70 miles. Cash's is only 10. I said, we might as well finish the trip, go to Cash's, catch some fish, and then go home. So that's what we did. But that was, that was a nasty day. Actually, Hugh and I both got sick that day. <laughs> <laughs> but the seasickness is funny. As I say, it probably saved my life. But in all the years that I fished my own boats, I never got sick once. Um, Not once on my own boats. And I was out in some long days in rough weather. Mm -hmm. And I can't explain it except to say that maybe it's just a matter of responsibility. Mm -hmm. You know, you get this responsibility to yourself and your boat and your crew. You don't have time for being sick. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think that's the, the case. Uh, back in, I'm backing up to these corks. We use these on the fish traps as well both the fish traps. Uh, those corks are available in this commercial fishing catalog. They've got a back page that's got a couple of things for decorative purposes. Six ninety five a piece. No. <laughs> Six ninety five a piece. Uh, what do we do with them now? <laughs> we have them strung up all over the backyard. <laughs> We, did, we discovered this quite by accident. We have a bird feeder out there, and the squirrels, of course, were always trying to get the bird feeder. And I've got two of these lines strung with these quarks from the shop to the house. And, and I, I think what happened was one day, one of the squirrels got up and he ah, run across this thing over the bird feeder, and he jumped on there, and the quark spun around, and he went slap. <laughs> they don't even try it anymore. <laughs> uh, I'm going to pass this around. This is the lead line that uh, we use on the net. So just pass it around, you can feel it. And uh, rather than the lead weights that we used to grip onto the line. Fought 
Every one of them thought of the loved one back on the shore. Then a flicker of light, and they knew they were right. There she was on the crest of a wave. She's an old fishing boat, and she's barely a boat. Please God, there are souls we can save and carry them home. Home, home from the sea, angels of mercy, answer our plea. And carry them home, home, home from the sea, carry them safely.